But last month, the board of directors of the Nigerian Economic Summit Group, following a board meeting, issued a communique. Uh, it was titled, Of Hope and Despair, Not Too Late to Turn the Curve on the State of the Nigerian Economy. Most macroeconomic indicators in Nigeria are pointing in the wrong direction, with many Nigerians facing severe hardship. The NESG is optimistic things can be turned around with the right decisions from leadership. Joining us to discuss further is uh, Mr. Chine Mba Uzoku, who is the CEO MD of GC Africa and also the chair of the Central Organizing Committee of the upcoming 28th Nigerian Economic Summit Group. Good morning to you, sir. Thank you so much uh, for, for, for joining us. Really good to, to have you with us. Thank you for having me. Good morning. So uh, in your view, uh, the Nigerian economy, hope, despair, a little of both. How, how do you see things for Africa's largest economy? First of all, I think I think the uh, the board of the NESG got this spot on. Yeah. Right. So the numbers tell the story, mm. and I think the trends are very clear as well to all of us in uh, qualitative terms. Yeah. So even anecdotally, everybody knows that there's a challenge that's facing us, and the key question was: Are we prepared to deal with that with that challenge and confront it, and and actually um, develop or evolve the kind of society and economy that we want? Hence the title. Um, is it a question of despair? I think, I think despair, you know, I, I see the world as, as being divided into two people, right? Those who look back and those who look forward. We want to be firmly in the space of look forward. And this is what Nigerians actually are by nature. You notice that regardless of the kind of conditions that they're in, the context, the difficulties that we're in, we keep trying to find a way out. This is a country that has never given into despair. And even though we are facing perhaps our greatest challenge in maybe 50 years, I think the call of the NESG board was to say, do not give in to despair. Mm. Have hope and let's figure the way out. Okay, okay. Um, so when the NESG says it's um, not too late to turn the curve, is that message for the present administration that just has a few months to go before they're out or the incoming administration, whoever that may be in, in 2023? Or is it maybe it's a message to both of them? Who is the message? I think that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's a super question. And, and, and the, answer is, the answer is the last, is the last really. Okay. Because, because when you look at where Nigeria is today, we didn't arrive here overnight. Mm. This didn't happen in the last four years or the last eight years or the last 10 years or so. It's a progression over 50 years, yeah. of 60 years actually. And, and we are where we are because oftentimes, even though we've known the direction to follow, we haven't actually taken that. And so um, there's this talk about being at a fiscal cliff. There's a question of Nigeria being at some kind of a precipice in terms of, uh, in terms of the society and the economy as a whole. And so the question that is, being, that is being asked appropriately, and I think so, is, is it too late to turn? No, the answer is no. It can never be late so long as we have people who are willing to make the change. And this is really what we're challenging Nigerians to ask themselves, where is this going? Do we like it? Yeah. Have we given up on our capacity to change this? And I think when you go out onto the streets every day across this country, you see people answering that question in a positive way. Mm. They want to change. They want to turn this around. And so the question is, what do we need to do? Okay, okay. Uh, we don't, we don't, don't talk politics here, but I mean, it's an election season and it is what it is. The economic leadership is going to be dependent on who is our new uh, president. Um, don't have to mention any names, but as far as the, <laughs> as far as the candidates that are running for office, um, with respect to the NESG's message about turning the curve, do you have faith that whoever it is amongst the pool, that one of them, whoever wins, is going to be able to turn, make that turn of the, the curve? So the, the way I want to answer that question is by saying that I do. Okay, okay. Nigerians do. Okay. And, and Nigerians are going to express that faith by going to the polls. And already we can see that there's a massive surge in terms of the interest of people um, in this election. Unlike other elections, maybe for the first time since 1993, we are seeing that the people themselves are the ones stepping forward and taking decisions and very early decisions around that and, and you know, really claiming the stake that they have. Mm. We're seeing people exercising what has now come to be known as the office of the citizen right. and stepping into that role and saying, well, we are the citizens. This, this, we, are the, we, we hold the, the highest office in the land mm. and therefore we will choose who we're going to hire into these roles. With regard to specific candidates, I think they're going to be a choice. But here's a very interesting thing, Rutus, and, yeah. and something that I find, um, maybe if, if you go back and you look into your WhatsApp or any of the social media things, and you, and you look at the conversations that are going on currently around the politics of Nigeria, yeah. you're hearing a lot about personality. Mm. And it's almost like that famous American president that said, it's the economy. Stupid. Right, I wanted right. you to say it, not me. <laughs> so, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, you know, um, uh, and, and this is what the issue is. So yeah. why are we not discussing the economy? 
why are we talking about personalities and things like that? Why are we not focused on this core issue mm. that is the real conversation, that's the urgent conversation that needs to be had? Because when you fix the economy, a lot of other things flow from there. Security, mm. health, education, all sorts of things flow from that. But once the economy is broken, then we really don't have much of a chance. And, and I think what we really need to find out is how do we pivot people? And this is what NESG is trying to say. Yeah. Let's turn that conversation around the politics of Nigeria and the elections of 2023 to the central issue that faces all of us, which is the state of Nigeria's economy, mm. and all else follows. Gotcha. All right, so the, the summit coming up next month, uh, I think it's titled 2023 and beyond uh, priorities for uh, economic priorities or so for shared economic prosperity or priorities to for shared economic prosperity. Right. What, what do you think those economic priorities are? I mean, so, is it power? Is it unemployment? Is it... Is it, uh, is it uh, the ICTs? I mean, there's so much. What, what do you think the priorities are? So, so what we've done under the guidance of the board is to come to a place where we're not looking necessarily into that granular stuff in terms of trying to figure out what the big, the big themes are. Okay. So we've got the big themes and we've got the sub-themes. And, and, and the sub-themes kind of like put things together into buckets that we think need to be addressed. Mm. So we know that there must be macroeconomic stability. And so we're asking ourselves, well, under the, under the sub-theme of macroeconomic stability, what needs to be done? And yes, we've talked about this. Yes, we know that inside this are things like power. Um, there are things like, like uh, uh, fiscal management. There are things like foreign exchange management. These are, are vital issues, but they sit within the larger um, 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 frame of how do we achieve economic, um, economic, macroeconomic stability? The second theme would be around in inclusive prosperity because, you know, we, we, we've had a country that has grown become the biggest economy in Africa, and yet we don't have jobs. Right. We can't have unemployment at 33%. We can't have youth unemployment at about 50-something percent. And yet we say the economy is growing. So mm. there's a question, and a very big question, around inclusiveness. How do we make sure that the most vulnerable in our society, the women, the poor, are brought into this boat that is taking us towards this place of economic prosperity? Otherwise, it's just going to create this situation where you have 0.1% of the people who are doing really well and 99% of the people are not doing so well. And we can already see from the data that's coming up post-COVID that we're actually increasing the number of people who fall into that poverty space. Mm. So it doesn't really matter how the economy moves if it doesn't carry everyone along. And then we look at things like, like what are the binding constraints to achieving these goals? Because we always say Nigeria has, has excellent plans. And frankly, from the rolling development plans in the 1970s coming forward to, to today and the, and the MTEF that has just come out and the Agenda 2050, fantastic plans put together by really intelligent people. The question is, why hasn't it been executed? What's been the challenge? Mm. And so we start to look and try to unpack that space and to say, within this context, can we identify the things that are making it difficult for us to achieve that? Um, is it about the civil service and empowering the civil service? Is it about uh, creating a kind of... Um, process of transparency that allows things to actually go forward and accountability around that? Is it about institutional strengthening? Is it about the manpower that's inside that space? What are those binding constraints? And we need to find those things and remove them because literally, like we said, everything can be right, but the executional capacity is not there. Mm. And then we look at investing in our future because we, we keep talking about Nigerians and Nigerians being, uh, Nigeria being a country that is filled with young people like me. I mean, I, 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 we can like think to ourselves, where, can, where is this country really going to? Yeah. What kind of future are we creating for these people? And mm. the truth is that the future is already here. But it's here for some people right, in a very positive others. way, yeah. and it's very negative for other people in, 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 another, in another, another segment. How mm. do we then begin to think about that and one of the critical areas in that space is investing in the future by investing in young people. And that means that we have to figure out the financing of, of education, for example. And just, just, to, just on that one point, yeah. we, currently, we currently train a medical doctor for six years at a cost of about $300. Mm. Wow. This same medical doctor is trained in the US for about $800,000. Right. In the UK for about 300,000, 400,000 pounds, right? Well, we would say, so when you see those differentials in South Africa, it's about $50,000, right? So you, you, when you look at these differentials, you ask yourself, well, clearly this $300 doctor cannot be a good doctor. Right. But the answer, well, that, that answer is incorrect. Because if the doctor is not a good doctor, why are they in demand abroad? Right. Why are we able to take our, our, the, the products of our um, uh, med education system in medicine and they're in demand abroad? Why are we able to do that with technology? Clearly, there's a challenge. Nigeria is subsidizing the cost of educating people 
at such a level that it becomes attractive to other people to hire our people and difficult for us to keep our people here. So we need to figure out the funding, the financing part of education. Globally, the cost of delivering education has gone up. In Nigeria, it has been frozen for nearly 40 years. If you went to University of, of, of Ife at that time, which is now Bafumi Awolo University, and you yeah. paid 90 naira then, you're still paying 90 naira now mm. for some aspects of the, of the fees. And we don't charge tuition in our universities. So clearly there are things around investing in that, in that future. And lastly, and most important to us, is this issue of, of transformational leadership. Because when we look at all that's happening in the country today, and we look at the challenges we face, particularly at the sub-national levels, and graduating all the way up to a national level, we're left with this key question, do we have the right kind of people? Rotus, can you sit in your village, in your local government, or yeah. even in your state and have a conversation like we're having today? Mm. <laughs> How many of these governors or councillors or legislators can well, engage in an to... economic issue right. and try to sort out and ask themselves the question, how are we going to fund education? Because that's where education sits, mm. at a subnational level. Yeah. The, the fact that we cannot have those discussions means that we don't, have, we don't yet have the right kind of leaders. Mm. And so the, the summit is looking at not just shaping the agenda for this transformational leadership, but what is the process of, of, of hiring this transformational leadership? What does it really look like, a transformational leader? Mm. And, and how do we get this? How do we make the right choice? So that when we have the right leader and we give them the tools and the agenda and we give them the support from the office of the citizen, change can happen. And that is the hope. And, you know, we have, well, when we, we have a sweetener at that last bit, which I'll, I'll keep to myself for okay. now. But, but, but fundamentally, that's, that's really what it's all about. So, yeah. yes, there's power. Yes, there are roads. There's transportation, all those things. We've talked about those things through the various um, uh, Nigerian Economic Summits. We've made recommendations. Some things have happened. Um, but that's not the key thing. The central mm. issue is going to be on that last element. How do we get the transformational leaders that we want at every level of Nigeria's governance structure so that leadership can work with the followership that is now activated to create the country that we desire. Fantastic. Um, what's your view on, as far as part of what's going to be discussed, um, government getting out of the way of the private sector so it can thrive? Uh, how do you think? you think that's something that's important for where we need to go? I think it's a great thing to do, and it's already manifesting in many areas. I mean, I, I'm young enough to, to, to know when it wasn't this way, when yeah. we didn't have telephones, when, we didn't have, when hotels were run by government, when all sorts of those things were held by government. And we've seen the benefit of letting go. The private sector, when it comes into a situation, literally transforms the, the, the entire um, um, sect, sector or that particular type of business. And so it's a great argument to have. But let's look at Nigeria as a whole. Right? And we ask ourselves, when we say government should get out of the way, how does government get out of the way where the private sector in some states is too small to actually power growth? So it isn't a single formula. It's a great mantra to have, and mm. it's one that is real, but we have to recognize that there are differences across the entirety of this country. And this is where the transformational leadership comes in. So if you're sitting in a state that has a nascent private sector, there are many states in this country that you go to and you can't even find a cyber cafe in the state capital. Right. There are many places where you have 2G and, you know, and 3G networks operating. There are many places where you don't, have, you don't have the kind of strength that a Lagos has. And of course, we now we know, of course, that out of 36 states, right. only three states are basically economically viable. Right. And that the GDP of Lagos um, alone, or the IGR of Lagos alone, is equivalent of maybe 30 states in Nigeria. So clearly there are differences in our country. And, and that difference and that diversity is actually our strength. But we need to have the leaders asking themselves in their local context, what do we need to do in Zamfara? What do we need to do in Bayelsa? What do I need to do in Ekiti? What do I need to do in Edo? What do I need to do in, in, uh, in Bronu? Each state has an economy. And that economy will have a, a composition that is different from the next state, even the neighboring states. Right. The, the key thing a leader needs to do, work with the people to articulate the vision for what you can do best at the subnational level and create that economy. Where government is able to let go to the private sector, it should let go immediately. Where government is not able to do so, it should actually step in and assist private sector growing to the capacity that it needs to begin to do the things that need to be done. Hmm. But we make a mistake when we try to have one strategy across 36 states. Right. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Yeah. It doesn't work individuals. Uh, final question for you. you. You think government, does government listen and when it comes to different you know, think tanks like the NESG, um, and all these other ideas that are brought forward. Do, do, you, do, you, do you think, well, do you think government listens and one, are you hopeful that they will listen more in order to implement all these ideas that are being put forward? 
Great question. So, so governments all over the world don't listen. <laughs> we all know that. So, so you know, and this is why you have the think tanks. This is why right. you have things like NESG. So, this is this is an organisation that was put together by private by the private sector, um, the organised private sector to help this conversation happen, and to help the interaction happen. And this is the twenty eighth summit that is coming up. So, for twenty eight years, people have been for twenty eight summits. We've been convening and holding these discussions with governments and talking to governments at the national and at the subnational level engaging and working out policy and, 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 and necessary next steps. Have we been successful? I would say yes, because government does listen and because government is a partner in the summits, you know, um, um, has been a partner in the summits over the past uh, maybe four or five years now. So we're starting to see that government is understanding the, the, that there is a benefit to an NESG. There is also continuous support because, you know, in NESG, we all are volunteers. We, we, we pay to serve. So everyone who's been in NESG, who works for NESG, apart from the core secretariat, is not on a salary. Mm. If you go to Abuja, you pay your, you pay your airfare. If you go and you're in a hotel, you're, you're paying your hotel bill. It's a contribution by people who I really, really believe are patriots, who over a period of time, from generation to generation, have invested in a Nigerian project in a very real way. And so, is government listening? The answer is yes. Yep. Many of the things that we see today that are policies that have been translated into action actually started in the summits and have manifested in laws and legislation. So yes, they are listening. We need to keep their, keep their feet to the fire yeah. and we need to keep the conversation going. All right, uh, uh, Mr. Chine Mba Ozoku, uh, MDC or GC Africa, also chair of the uh, organizing committee for the NESG uh, Summit 28th, which is coming up next month. We hope the government does listen and implements all the ideas. October you guys 24th with. and 25th. Fantastic. Which is not next month. It's, oh, okay, it's, actually, yeah, this yeah. is the, next, the four, yeah. two months from now. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks for joining. I hope to have you back to stay to talk more about this. Thank you for having me. All right.